Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 355 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, I talk with artist Kate Roberts. I first got to know Kate's work by looking at her large-scale ceramic sculpture and site-specific installations. Recently, she has been doing some printing with clay dust, and she actually has an exhibition up right now at the Jane Hartsock Gallery in New York City titled After Image. If you'd like to hear Kate talk about that exhibition, you can listen to her artist talk, which will be online this Friday. That's January the 15th, and that's going to be happening at 5 p.m. Eastern. You can find out more about signing up for that talk at GreenwichHouse.org. You can also check out images of Kate's work at KateRobertsCeramics.com. Before we get to that interview, I'd like to thank some of the folks that have been donating to our fall fun drive. We are listener supported, so I'd like to thank Courtney Metzler, Kyler Lundberg, and Christine Hibbard for their generous contributions. If you'd like to get involved with supporting this show, you can do that at talesoveredclayrambler.com slash donate. I'd also like to do today's Amico Community Cork Board, which is in support of ClayShare. This is a network for online ceramic learning that features classes, community forums, and other resources that will help give your studio practice a boost. The next workshop will be featuring Adam Field, who is teaching this weekend, January the 16th, and next weekend, January the 23rd, on cultivating inspirations in clay. If you'd like to sign up for that workshop or find out more about ClayShare, visit ClayShare.com. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Let's start talking about how literature has informed your work. Because I noticed in your MFA show, a lot of the titles were relating to, I think it was Great Expectations, right? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about literature, like how that's affected your work? Sure. Sure. Well, it's really funny because I'm not a huge avid reader, but I, but when I do read, I kind I, um, I prefer to read, uh, fiction, but then I also kind of try find myself, find myself reading, um, um, kind of more essay forms and things. And, and I tend to, you know, as I'm reading something, I kind of look for items that, um, maybe are kind of associated um, with what I'm, with what I'm doing. And so great expectations came out of like, I was, I had been working in this way that was kind of shabby chic and, and my aesthetic had kind of taken this turn. And I happened to, um, I think I just happened to like, I was in the studio a lot and I had an audible account and I, and I was like, Oh, you know, I've never read this before. Um, I should start, you know, I, I should check this out. And, um, and so I, um, I found a lot that kind of, um, there's a lot of themes within some of these kind of books and a lot of themes, a lot of the art or a lot of the authors that I read tend to be people from kind of the romantic era. And so it's a lot about, um, these situations where kind of nature and industry are, um, in some way, kind of um, uh, battling each other or there's a tension between the two. And so, you know, that's something that I'm really interested in is that we kind of like as humans tend to kind of try to put our mark on things and kind of we we try to, we're constantly at this mode where we're like, okay, we have to be better and, and greater and we have to um, make more and do more. And, and, and a lot of that comes with like this whole idea of technology too, is kind of coming into that. But then at the end of the day, there's like, for me, there's something where like nature is just kind of like, it has its own mind. It has its own, um, 
its own way of working. And so I go back to literature a lot because so oftentimes there might be a sentence or there might be kind of a phrase or there might be something that that links into what I am making at the time. So there's sometimes there's a mixture of fiction, but then also there's sometimes a mixture of kind of memoir too. Like Sally Mann is another person that I really felt strongly about that um, that book, uh, Hold Still, um, and the memoir there in terms of like her talking about um, growing up in the South and these um, items that are these things that kind of happened to her or these stories or histories about her. And it was the first time where I felt like I connected and could be okay with talking about the South too, in terms of my work and being like, okay, I can bring that into what I make. And, um, and I felt comfortable doing it, um, in some way. And so, you know, literature oftentimes is, is, um, it kind of verifies what I'm doing. And then it also, um, it also can be a jumping off point and it can give context to, um, to what I'm making. So that's helpful. Can you describe the work? They're very specific, but I want to talk about the decay element of them. But, so can you describe them? Sure. So they are these um, topiary pieces that um, vary in size. I kind of, um, some of them are a bit smaller, but then there's some that are kind of topiaries that you might find within kind of a mansion area and, um, and the foyer of a mansion. And so they are create, you know, they're, um, I was experimenting a lot with kind of adding other materials to um, the surface, but then also in the mixture of clay as well. And so these topiaries are these, flowers and the flowers in particular that I was looking at were peonies. Um, and this vase, and actually I'm specifically this vase of dead flowers that I carried around with me for um, many years that uh, actually at one point, I, sorry, this is where I start going into weird stories. But anyways, <laughs> at one point, um, I was, uh, I was a studio assistant for John and Andrea Gill, and they had this, uh, this kind of field of peonies in front of their studio and Andrea would cut them and she would bring them into the, the house and, and then she would forget about them and they would die. And she one day just came out to me in the studio and she's like, these are for you. And so I, I took them and I kept them for a very, very long time. And I would travel with them and I traveled with them for maybe about four or five years and then finally, when I was moving from Seattle to Memphis, I, I was just like, it's time for them to kind of um, die. But these flowers, they had their petals had kind of um, given way. They had kind of let themselves go. Um, and then also them just being in my studio, they were collecting all this dust. And there was just this kind of all these remnants of the studio were collecting on top of them. And I, I thought there was really something interesting about this tie between in Miss Havisham in the book Great Expectations, Miss Havisham is um, she's going to be. I don't think this is a spoiler alert for anyone, but she's she is um, she's going to be getting married, and so the whole her house is set up, or this one room in particular is set up for um, the reception, and. There's an image in there of um, many, many years later where this room is opened up again and there is this cake in the middle and all of these kind of arrangements and things and there's cobwebs growing on top of them. And, and it's kind of this idea that this place that, or this area that felt like it had a lot of value and importance and was going to be significant of a day kind of was like preserved by all of these other elements that came in and took over afterwards. So the spiders and the dust and, you know, all of that kind of took over. And so I just love that idea of something that had at once been alive and had once um, had some sort of um, meaning to someone um, being preserved. And so uh, these topiaries that I made were covered with um, fiber that was dipped in clay. And then I would um, spray with a hopper gun, which became my most favorite tool when I was in graduate school. I would spray clay slip um, through a hopper gun. So it'd make almost like a popcorn ceiling type 
uh, texture on it. And I would put these pieces in the kiln maybe about five or six times. So I'd take them out and then something might be like about to fall off. And I'd be like, no, 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 I'm going to spray it on, <laughs> spray some more slip on there. And I'm going to preserve that in there. So it was just these layers and layers caked on. Um, and there's, there's some really wonderful moments in graduate school where, you know, I put a piece in and then all of a sudden I'd open the kiln up and it had completely like fallen over and all of my grad cohorts <laughs> would help me kind of like lift it back up and try and then like enough that I could like spray it again and get it to like hold in place. So there was a lot of, um, a lot of kind of just experimentation and just kind of, um, constantly putting more and more stuff and dirt on top of these uh, topiaries. So, but then they ended up quite beautiful in the end. So there was this, um, this thing where you're like putting all this dirt and this kind of crap on top of this thing. And you're like, oh, I'm making this look really ugly. But then like in this ugliness, there's this like beauty that's um, comes out of that. And, and I think about that a lot in terms of Ms. Havisham too, is there was just all of this, you know, these expectations, these dreams, these thoughts of what was going to happen. And, you know, and then there's kind of a withering, a withering, but then at the same time, it's preserved in this kind of body and form and exoskeleton or whatever. And I just love that idea of the preservation of it all. So, and the humanness of it. Yeah, when I saw that work for the first time, it was around the time of your grad show. Uh, I, I just thought about death, but not death in a uh, a negative sense, but in a a slow decay of something that was magnificent. And I, it, it was it was sad, but it was I couldn't stop looking at it. I, ha, I think I had an image of your work like in my studio or something because it was it was just this like captivating accumulation of slip, but it looks like something like a flood or a hurricane came and just dumped everything on these pretty large, you know, outdoor topiaries. Um, so can you talk about how you think about um, sort of decay as an idea? So, you know, your making process, you are decaying it, you know, like you're making the object, then you're adding something to it and firing it, adding. So in a way you're decaying it, but can you talk about the bigger idea of decay? It's an interesting question because it's one I think a lot, I do think a lot about, and, and it's one, like, I think you always have people in your life that um, challenge you in some way. And I, I have a, a grad cohort that, um, that brought up one time something about my work in terms of like, um, oh, um, um, ruin porn, <laughs> which is kind of a topic that comes up um, a lot lately, especially with Detroit in terms of like, um, and I'm specifically talking about Detroit because that was a place uh, that decay was highly um, like put to the forefront and also decay was beautified in some way. Like it was like, okay, there we have all these buildings that are kind of like falling apart, but then look at this like really beautiful um, structure that's slowly kind of um, taking away. And so I, I kind of, I struggle sometimes with the decay in that because, you know, there is a sense where I don't want to create kind of ruined porn, like, you know, and, and thinking about that. But I also, I think about decay in terms of, um, and I, I think this link, this for me linked a lot back to the South too. Um, and particularly with this idea of something being very slow and something being very, um, um, like the humidity and thinking about that in particular. But I, I think it's this idea that we're somewhere, we kind of linger um, between the past and present. We linger between these things. And so when I think about decay, I think about it in terms of um, that it's a slow process and that it's something that I'm currently living and that we're all currently living in um, and that we as beings are decaying. <laughs> right as we speak to at the same time. But, um, but I love the, the way that all of a sudden, but then I see, yes, I see a beauty in it too. And I can't help but see that. And I think it's because there's growing up, there was a lot of this idea of kind of um, being really attuned to things that were from the past and treasuring them and 
being aware of their importance and, um, and at a certain time. And so decay is such a kind of very fragile and it feels like we can't, we try to capture it, but we can't completely capture it too at the same time. As you're talking, I was thinking about, um, you know, like in, in my family, my, my, I don't want to be too morbid, but my grandfather has recently passed and his slow decay over years has been interesting because at different times, my mother would come and say, you've got to come home for Christmas this year, which I usually did unless I was overseas. But she would say, you've got to come home because I don't know if your grandfather will make it another year. Well, that was 15 years ago. Like, like he was a resilient person. He lived until his nineties into to, in fact, 93. So I really thought about like, what was his experience of aging versus what our experience was? Because my mom obviously thought he was going to pass away, but he didn't, he was still living. You know, his body was, you know, kind of breaking down. He had some mobility issues, but his mind up until right to the very end was very sharp. So it's just interesting, this internal versus external state of decay and how that, you know, plays out in a person's life, but also a city's life. Like oftentimes places like Detroit, depending on where you are, that that might be the most part of the the most vibrant part of the city, but an outsider might think that it's decaying. So there's this like perspective shift depending on who you are and what's happening. Well, absolutely. And I mean, and you just reminded me too of like, I mean, I think it's a shared experience of like, you reminded me of my grandmother. You reminded me of like, she has Alzheimer's. She, her body looks one way. Her mind is a completely different way. And so sometimes there's um, this idea, yes, this, these internal and external forces that we can't necessarily control. And, and it becomes really hard to watch that too. It becomes um, something that very, becomes very visceral to us. And, and I also, you know, it's, it's something that when I moved to Memphis too, um, and I'm not sure if you've ever been to Memphis before or, um, but it's a very different, you know, like I grew up in the South, I grew up in a very kind of bucolic area. Um, and, and then I went to, you know, I went to Memphis and I, there's parts of this city that are just kind of falling apart and that are kind of holding on by little, little things. And, but what I love about some of these things is that there's a story there, like every single thing that we consider something that has decayed or has fallen apart or has gone through these motions, there was something that existed there. There was something that lived, that had a life that held some sort of importance to someone And I think that that's, you know, in some ways, like when I do kind of recreate these moments or make this, it's, it's the significance that we were there or that we did have a presence and I, I want to preserve that. So let's bring into the discussion your work that there are these large gate um, type structures that you're building. Well, first, can you describe how you build them and then how this idea of accumulation in your building process goes into that work? I guess prior to kind of talking about that, too, I think there was a major shift for me from leaving graduate school to to being out in whatever you want to call it, the real world or something like that. Um, and I think there is a shift for me in responsibility and also in also um, thinking about where my materials come from and um, and also thinking about um, how much I'm using and and what could be recycled. Um, and then also, you know, I was making really, really fragile work in undergrad, graduate school my whole entire life. And I was, you know, a lot of times that work um, was very ephemeral in terms of like, you know, it was very fragile. It could break really easily. It didn't have a very a, a longevity to it. And so um, when I started, when I left graduate school, I was like, well, I want to make, I continue want, wanting to make work like that. Like I always love making work that's on the edge. Like I love having a bit of a panic attack when <laughs> I don't know if it's going to work or not. <laughs> And, and it still happens to this day. I can only feel it's like someone who is 
doing something super dangerous. Like it feels like that when I'm like making work that's, that doesn't feel like it might actually work out. I started making these gate pieces because I, I wanted to make work that I could just travel to a place and I could have whatever sort of materials on hand and I could just make there. And because like one thing that I was finding was really hard for me was trying to ship my work and, um, and trying to get it to places. So I was like, okay, well, I want to want to be able to go there and make the work on site. And so that, that was kind of the impetus for this to start it. And then um, I had been looking at these gate structures and, and I've always had gates in some ways within or structures that are kind of cages within and this kind of line quality that comes out of these places. And so I, I, I don't honestly know how I kind of like ended up deciding I was going to build on fishing line. Um, but I started to hang fishing line from the ceiling and I was like, okay, well, what if I start putting fiber in this clay, which I had already been kind of doing, um, when I was building in the topiaries and things, but I was noticing that the fiber, when it dried, it had the really kind of hard structure to it and with the clay that was mixed in it. And so when I build these gates, I built them by, um, kind of putting lines or a grid of, um, fishing line hanging from the ceiling. And then I tape it to the ground and then I just start uh, building on top of the fishing line, um, and then start connecting lines to other lines and kind of over, over time. I also, you know, another thing was, is like, I don't know about other people when they leave graduate school, but I was um, in a situation where I was teaching and then two days a week um, at the University of Wisconsin. And then um, the other two days a week, I was a nanny. And then the other day of the week, I was a um, elementary school um, uh, substitute teacher. And so I was, um, I was kind of going back and forth with things. So me having like a full day in the studio was a very hard thing to have. And so being able to build in a way where it was okay if something dried out and I could just kind of continue to build on top of it gave me the ability to continue to make, um, because I was definitely having a very difficult time, um, organizing my time in a way that I could keep something alive in the studio. And so, and I also, you know, like that idea of kind of like being able to instantly make something that kind of instant gratification. And it, it's continued on till this, to this very day where, you know, I, I can finish a piece fairly quickly, but also I can put a piece on hold um, for a while. And so, um, so when I'm building these gates, I can leave them and maybe not touch them for a couple of days and then come back and continue to build on top of them. And the fiber gives me that flexibility to be able to do that. And so, um, and that's also what has been wonderful about being able to go to another place and build them on the site is that um, I, I can source the materials from that place. I can, um, and, I can um, kind of build at weird times and kind of come back and forth to it. And then lastly, what has been super rewarding about it and was something that was kind of on my conscious for a long time was being able to reuse the material. And so whenever possible, I reuse the material that comes back, like once it's finished, once the piece is, is done, I can reuse it. And that, um, that held on my conscience when I was making really fragile work and was feeling like I was throwing away a lot of things. And I, I was just like, this does not feel sustainable. And, and not even just as for myself, it didn't feel sustainable for like what I wanted to give back to the world too. So one of my undergrad teachers used to talk about the magic green box, which was the dumpster. And how so much of the work we made was just going to go in the dump, the dumpster. And I think as artists, we all have to decide that, like how much, like ideally we could sell things, but if they're bad things and they're really just, or not bad, but if they're more important because it was a progression in your mind, people don't really need to see those. So in a way you figured out the, the way to work, which is, is that you just reslake that clay and then it goes into the next idea. But it doesn't end up. Um, making you money. 
end up. <laughs> so you take a risk in that. So if you decide that you're going to make it in this, you know, and, and that's another question of like, okay, well, you decide you create this process for yourself and that it gives you this freedom to make it the way that you want to, but then you also have something that you kind of gave up, you know, or that you have to, and that's like life <laughs> in some ways where you have to kind of navigate that back and forth. So it, it brings up other problems and issues or challenges, not problems, challenges that you have to solve. So, so when you're building on this, this, uh, fishing line, how do you get the clay to stick the very first time you're putting it on there? Are you just like (laughs) squeezing it around there? Yeah, it's, it's squeezing. Um, you know, well, there's, yes, the very first one going on is always the hardest, And I build in stages. So I'll put maybe like, and I cut my fiber. So I use a, um, well, I use a sisal fiber. I started out by using jute fiber. um, And then I came across, well, I was sitting there taking little tiny pieces of jute apart in order to be able to do this. And it was just like, too much. And it was, I mean, I loved it, but I also was like, this is a lot of work (laughs) for this big thing. And in the United States, they don't sell jute just loose like that. Oddly enough, if you go like I I did an installation in Switzerland, they sell this jute loose because plumbers use it to wrap pipes and things with in order to kind of attach them. So it's, it's something that they use for that, but they don't have that in the United States. It's technically illegal. So um, I, I started using sisal rope because I met a, um, I met a graduate student when I was at the University of Washington named Peter Barber, who's somebody who I've worked with on some other projects before uh, since then. But um, he was just taking a huge thing of sisal rope and putting it in some water and cutting it apart and being like, here we go. And I was like, oh my God, that's so much easier. (laughs) And so, um, and it takes so much less time. So I use sisal for the most part as this kind of fiber that I'm using. And um, I cut it into lengths that are maybe like uh, three to four inches in kind of lengths of of, um, loose fiber. And so when I'm building, I'm actually building in maybe like five to six inch sections at a time. So I, I will attach it and kind of squeeze it onto the, um, the fishing line. And then I let it dry because if I continue to, the funny thing is if I continue to try to add onto that, it actually drags down and it actually kind of, um, um, will end up falling off of the four of the fishing line. So I have to do it in stages and, and, uh, and that kind of allows me to then work on different areas at different times, but that's when letting it dry and letting it harden is really to, it is advantageous to me is to kind of let that set up. And I think it was the piece in Switzerland. This, it was a massive gate. Like it looks like it's 20 feet across or so. About 30 feet across yeah mm-hmm. and what that implies I, I was I just saw an image of it in a video but what it implies is that you're in front of a building or a property that's big enough to have a 30-foot gate so there's this sense of awe in the process because you're you, you know you're seeing this this structure but there's also some class there like it's it, it seems like you're inferring that you're standing outside of something grand in the same same with topiaries you know like the I've never had a topiary in my yard because I've never had a house that would have a topiary. So can you talk about how class plays into this? It's definitely something that that I never had um, growing up. It's definitely something that, you know, we might go to that area of town or something and there's this great grand gate in front of a house. Um, and, you know, and that's just, you're like, oh, that's not really... <laughs> I don't know anybody who would live there. I don't enter, you know, I don't interact. So there's definitely, yes, class comes into play with that. And class is kind of like, for me, it goes back to this idea, like, um, so the gate, yes, the gate is a situation where um, it is a barrier that for some of us, we can go through and some of us, we can't go through. Um, The gate is, it's a threshold. It's also a place where we, um, that marks a space between two um, situations. So recently I made one in um, Korea and 
And in Korea, that idea of making a gate for me was kind of this um, separation between two countries or between two land masses. And, um, and, and that, um, that was kind of significant for me in that case of these, um, these places that might be very similar, but also are kind of um, just by putting one structure up. Um, and you all of a sudden are saying, nope, you can't pass through that. But, but when I'm making these pieces like this gate, the fact that it is unfired, that it is not permanent, that it is not, is for me saying this thing that, you know, we have all of these situations that we think are symbolic of something that is of greater importance or of greater um, value. But at the end, uh, they're just a thing that can be broken down or that um, can be taken over. And it goes back to even like Miss Havisham's, you know, that space, um, like even just her house when it's talked about is that it's all overgrown, it's all taken over. There's no, you know, the, the idea of it's kind of grandeur is hidden by all of this other stuff. And so for me, um, I'm kind of trying to break down that kind of barrier in some way and kind of making it feel a little bit more like, um, yes, we think it's there, but it's also just as vulnerable um, to, to the elements or to um, situation. Um, and so, yeah, I do tend to, I mean, those, those pieces in particular were absolutely about kind of talking about something that we try to attain, but at the same time is is going to end up just like us <laughs> and has no greater kind of value to it too. So with these big shows that you're having, if they're overseas, like in Korea, I think that was, was that right at the beginning of the pandemic? It, <laughs> oddly enough, that show, that show was like such a funny situation <laughs> because it happened in um, September of 2019 um, and that show, you know, I feel for everybody who was in that Korean biennial show because in the, and they, they, the people who are running it did very well in terms of like making us feel a little bit better about it. But, um, that show first was marked with swine flu. <laughs> so it was, it, um, was, we were supposed to have this like grand opening and right as it was about to happen, all of us, or not all of us, but a huge amount, huge huge group of us were over there. Um, we were sent home <laughs> pretty quickly because of swine flu. And so it didn't end up having this kind of grand opening and it was, um, everything was kind of closed. And then when it did open, maybe two months later then the pandemic <laughs> happened. So it was kind of this show that felt like um, it never happened <laughs> sometimes <laughs> because we, we had so many weird you know, situations, kind of circumstances that, you know, made you feel like it was going to be this huge thing. And then you're like, oh, <laughs> okay. And I, and I think that's something that, um, sorry, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but I think that's something that in terms of like having all of these situations where you have certain things that happen to you that are really, really good, that you, you hold them, you're like, oh my God, my life is going to change. It's going to, you know, everything's going to happen. And then you have these moments that bring, make you more humble that you're like, well, <laughs> no, <laughs> like we're just going to let that go. And so it's, you know, it's made me feel um, in terms of having even showing during a pandemic too, is being like, it's okay. <laughs> like there's been worse that, you know, that it's, it's totally fine. So it takes a little bit of the pressure off of it um, after a while, but anyways, that was that poor show. <laughs> but what was great about it is, is I met a lot of really wonderful people like uh, Tip Toland was over there at that time. And, um, oh, uh, um, Walter McConnell, who was my teacher before, um, Matt Kelleher <laughs> showed up. There were a lot of people who kind of showed up right as we were getting ready to be sent home. <laughs> and so um, there was a little bit of time where we got to know each other a little bit better. So that there, there were some good things that came out of that. 
Well, also this this way of working, like building a site specific installation in another country, is inherently risky. Like in the, in this way, the swine flu, you know, put a damper on things, and of course, the pandemic has been horrible. But even in good times, you can go to somewhere, and like you mentioned, like in Switzerland, the materials are slightly different, so it helped you. But it could be the opposite. Like you go somewhere and you're like, I really need this one thing, but it's hard to tell till you get there whether, you know. I guess you can research it, but there's just all this risk that you're taking. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I'm, when I'm having to send things, I mean, when I made the piece in Switzerland, I did not really realize the difference between kilograms and pound, kilos and pounds. And so when I was ordering, I, I feel so they were such a supportive um, foundation at the foundation Bruckner. They were such a supportive organization, but we ordered way too much material. (laughs) Um, And mostly because I just like, didn't, I didn't know, um, you know, how much some, in some cases, how much I would need, but then also, um, you know, I worked one way where I was taking apart, you know, rope and then come to find out, oh, we can find it already taken apart. And so we ended up with like a lot of extra rope left over that never gotten taken apart and, and um, so much slip left over too. And that actually happened in Korea as well. So in some ways it was nice that um, to have too much and not enough, but there's, there's, there's so much risk in that. And there's, there's a lot in terms of like, um, you know, I've learned, you know, I send pictures back and forth. Like that's a lot of what ends up happening is like, because there's a language barrier or there's a difference in um, a way we might describe something. And so um, I don't even come to find out. I don't even remember what the rope was like in Korea. It worked. It was fine, but I don't remember exactly. Um, I think I, I think they understood. I think we figured some things out, but yes, there's always, there's always something that's, that's uh, kind of a risk. And there's also like, um, the other thing is, is like, you leave this thing, you make this thing, and then you have to let it go. And so um, that's something that has become easier and easier. But actually, the ones that are the hardest to let go are the ones where you have all these memories tied to them. So when I made the one in um, Switzerland, I had such a wonderful experience making it. And there were all these other artists who were also there making, um, there were these two artists. Um, one was from Iceland, Erna school, daughter. And, um, the other was, uh, Karen can't think of her last name, but she's from Sweden and they were making an installation together. And it just, you know, I was so glad that I didn't have to destroy that one. <laughs> because I had so many things that were kind of like um, weaved in there into that piece that I didn't want to forget. Well, I want to pivot to talk about some of the more recent work you've been making, which is taking this idea of seeing through something. So like with the gate work, you could see through the gate and usually see the shadows of the lighting behind it, which was really beautiful. But then it seems like the next evolution is how do you see through layers of information to see what's behind it and how can that make an image? So the first work I saw that was like this, um, was, was it We Walk on Ghost or what's, what's the name of that? Walking on Ghost. So can you describe what the images were and how they're still three-dimensional? Well, you know, what's interesting too is that first question you asked me about literature, the title Walking on Ghost actually came from a quote um, that I had read in a... Um, these, uh, this series of that Whitechapel um, created and um, these series of kind of books on different topics um, that uh, the topic was ruins. And so I was reading this, um, I was reading um, some of these different, uh, these collected essays from artists and also um, curators and things. And, and uh, this, that title came from this piece that what are this, quote about how this person was seeing all of these buildings um, being taken down and falling in glass. I think it was Glasgow. Um, And that people were, they were reusing the material to make the um, sidewalks that people walked on. So you were walking on ghost. And I thought that that was such an interesting 
image in terms of like thinking about that. Yes. Like all of this space that we're walking on is we're walking on ghost, that there's something underneath, um, here. And so those, those, um, those pieces are in at least the pieces I've been making lately. I've been drawing a lot from once again, the romantic era, but, um, particularly these people like, uh, David Casper Ka Friedrich and these painters who are kind of taking some of these ruins or taking some of these things and kind of highlighting them. And so, um, when I was making this piece walking on ghost, uh, it's an image that starts off as these kind of trees, um, in this kind of field. And then as you start to look through, um, the field disintegrates and it's almost like all of that material that's been passing through goes to make buildings instead. And so for me, that piece was, um, it was first shown at Enseca, but it was made primarily for a show that was going to be happening in Seattle. And when I lived in Seattle, I was watching all of this, um, so much, uh, oh, um, so many buildings being either torn down or, um, or kind of put up in spaces that were really kind of, um, dense, dense in some way. And then also like, you know, it also reminded me too of growing up and watching subdivisions being put in where you would have this whole area that was completely full of trees. And then the next day you'd go by and it was like completely slaughtered and, uh, and then houses would come. And, um, and so I, you know, I was thinking about these kind of moments where, where this thing changes or this material might then get used to make something else. And then we also kind of lose that other thing too. So we lose this, um, this nature, we lose, um, these moments, but, I, but I liked it being this idea of, of dust passing through a screen and then getting collected on another one and then collected on another one and kind of like the image changing as you pass through. And so that, that was the first one. And those ones were, were very um, spaced um, quite a distance apart. And so the other idea was that you could walk through them is that you could kind of be in between and see um, other people through them as well. And so, you know, I like, I think the screen is something that, um, well, it was just another way of me thinking about something that's ephemeral, something that, um, that we kind of sieve and that information gets sieved through and, uh, and dust, dust was just, dust was dirt. Dust was this other kind of, um, material that comes from some sort of decay or some sort of destruction. We should describe for the, the viewer this, the one piece I'm thinking about was this four uh, circular images. And is it that the dust is screen printed onto the mesh? How do you get it to stick? <laughs> Glue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am re I love process. <laughs> I love, I teach it a lot in my, um, my classes. I love, um, I love just, uh, and I love the problem solving of trying to figure out how to do that because, and, and these pieces have definitely gone from kind of different certain things. My husband is a printmaker. And so I was watching, you know, I'm watching him. Um, he's mostly done, does a lot of screen printing. And, and when I see him put an image together, he really considers what's going to be on top of the other one and on top of the next one and that sort of thing. So when he takes an image, he kind of dissects it and kind of expands it. And, and I, you know, and so I'm watching him do that. And then, um, and so I'm thinking, okay, well, how do I do that in ceramics? You know, you, there's other ways of doing it. It's like, it's not a new technique. I mean, people screen print on clay all the time, but I was thinking more about, um, I first started when I was screen print, when I was doing these dust prints is I actually was screen printing um, glue onto velvet and then sprinkling dust on top of that and seeing how the velvet um, would absorb and would also make it really hazy too at the same time, because the velvet was this really interesting fiber that could kind of hold this dust. Um, and, you know, anytime that you like 
drops something on t- like when you're in the clay studio and you drop dust on your pants and then you try to wipe them off. Like, I love that idea of this thing kind of getting caught inside of it. So I first started with screen printing and then, um, I got a little, I wanted to make the work bigger. I always want to make the work bigger. And I think that comes from, um, I had a teacher who was like, I I'm five, I'm five feet. And I have a teacher, I had a teacher when I was in undergrad, who was like, you're, you're small, you should make bigger work. And so I just like always in my head, I'm always thinking I need to make the work larger, which my husband, who is also like, um, helping me put things together and ship things and stuff is like, what if you made it just a little bit smaller? Like, wouldn't that be a great idea? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 it has to be bigger. And it's mostly the scale of us kind of like a one-to-one of relationship of us as humans to the piece too. But anyways, when I was starting to make these pieces that were on the the um, mesh, uh, the screen printing wasn't working quite as well. So I ended up just painting the glue onto the pieces and then sifting the dust onto the glue and then pulling the pieces up really quickly. (laughs) And so some dust falls through and some is kind of gets left over. And so it's, um, and, and that has kind of evolved now to mixing the dust into the glue and, um, and it's a more of a watery glue glue solution. And that's taken a, that's taken a bunch of kind of tests and, and things because, um, there's, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a huge learning curve in doing these things that you've never done before <laughs> and not knowing if, and, and who knew humidity was also a thing in terms of once you actually put the stuff on, on the thing, you have dust on a piece. And then all of a sudden you live in the South and the humidity comes back to bite you in the butt and makes everything wrinkly. So it's just like a, it's just like all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, I thought I figured that out now. Nope. Didn't. So there's, there's a lot of kind of um, risk in that. In these pieces there, there was space in between like the circular pieces you could walk around, you could walk in between maybe like three feet or two feet in between. But then this most recent show that you're having um, that's actually up right now at Greenwich house called after image Everything has been compressed into the space of what we would think of as like a canvas size. So you have some diptychs and triptychs, but essentially this way of screen printing on mesh, they are put together so you can see within the frame of the the painting of the print. I don't know what you really call these things. Yeah. You can see the image being made in a very concise way. So can you talk about the evolution of this idea and like why things have gotten compressed into what is essentially a frame? I think I've, I've been playing back and forth between the idea of them being expanded and then being compressed. And so I don't see it as like that this is the final way because I think that there's, there's things that I really love about them being expanded and what you lose, the detail that you might lose when they are expanded like that. And then there's things that happen when something, an image like that is compressed in terms of like, it almost gets foggier. Um, And so it goes back and forth where you can start to play around with our perspective, like how we, how we perceive a space and how we, um, and also, also the, the other thing that I'm liking right now about them being compressed is it's a little like, and maybe this is going on a limb, but it's a little like, you know, when you're looking at the Mona Lisa and you're like watching her eyes from every the base and like you you're like oh she doesn't move but when you're looking through these pieces all of a sudden the image gets distorted just a little bit if you look at it from one angle and then if you move your body to another angle and I like that kind of slight adjustment between all of that but what I like about the compressed space right now is that um and I'm and I'm not gonna lie I think a lot of us you know dealing with the pandemic and dealing with you know what's happening um at the moment, we are a lot more kind of compressed in our minds and we are kind of like, there's a bit of a fogginess. And so for me, these pieces, like they were based, they started off based on this kind of compression of 
the space that was happening out in the Pacific Northwest during the, and also in California during the forest fires that were happening um, earlier last year. But they were, um, they, you know, when you're in the middle of something like that, you can't see, you can't, you know, you're just kind of like, there's, there's no room to kind of perceive, you know, what's right in front of you. And so I liked that idea that all of a sudden that space got compressed, that you couldn't really kind of tell from one layer to the other layer. Um, and, but it, but it's definitely these two kind of different bodies of work. It's something I want to continue to work um, a little bit more on because I like playing around with that idea of perception and, and what gets lost. How do you get them into the frame? Cause there's, I think there's mostly four layers or maybe two layers, but you've printed on them. They're very thin and I think it's tool, right? Is that the material? Yeah. It's tool. It's like a pet. It's what they make petticoats out of like under, <laughs> under, it's like a very, um, thick tool. Um, so it's a grid, uh, kind of mesh, um, like thing. Um, they, there's six layers for most of them. There's about six layers. And so it's once again, thinking about, like, I started out with these images that, you know, I was sourcing these from, um, from, uh, from the internet, from what was happening out in the Northwest, in the Pacific Northwest. And, um, and then I would alter them too. Like I would, um, I would mirror them onto themselves. I would um, kind of thinking about the, also the idea of after image, um, you know, what gets burned in our, what gets burned there, what also gets lost, what do we kind of sustain through this? Um, but anyways, these pieces are stretched onto um, six uh, frames. And then the frame is, then there's a much larger frame that kind of um, goes around all of them. So um, I, I stretch them on each frame first and then attach all the frames together. Well, I shouldn't say I do that. I should say my husband was very, very helpful in doing this because um, I am not very good at using the table saw. So <laughs> I, so I need a lot of help in terms of, in terms of that. So um in some ways, Alex Williams made a lot of this work <laughs> for this show. <laughs> um, and, and I'm very grateful for that. Well, congrats. The, the work is beautiful. It, it has the same ephemeral quality that your earlier sculpture did. So can you talk about how when you're moving from, I don't want to say something that's purely 3D, but something that is everyone would recognize as a 3D sculpture to a two-dimensional print, that still has 3D qualities, but we really see it as a 2D image. Can you talk about the idea of ephemerality? Like, how do you, as an artist, think about that idea through 2D and 3D materials? I guess I don't, um, and this might be a cop-out answer. <laughs> I don't really see them. I, I mean, yes, we all have to put labels on something um, in terms of what we're making. But I see the 2D piece, the, the, what you might think of as 2D pieces, I still see them as three-dimensional pieces, even though they're attached to the wall. I think it's just um, what the dust has lent itself to for me right now. Um, I think, and, and that's another reason why I, really, I, I love working with clay, is um, that there are these different these different states that it can be in and that it doesn't have to necessarily be always this kind of wet material that um, is, has a mass to it um, and that you can thin it out, that you can paint with it, that you can um, take the, you take what's dried up and grind it into a really, you know, thin, um, material or small, tiny particle size. And then all of a sudden that's what you then get to use to make something. And, and I, um, I think right now that the dust has kind of, I, I looked at it as the dust needed some sort of substrate to attach itself to. And, and that became this kind of flat, um, panel, but I, I would definitely say, you know, and, 
And maybe he keeps coming up in this conversation because that's the only person I've seen for a very long time. But um, I, I do think that, you know, my watching my husband make um, has definitely influenced uh, the way that I think about using these materials too. But I would also, also always say that I've always made, even going back to undergrad when I was drawing like using a cake decorating tube to draw slip uh, with slip, I was still just making line drawings and I was still making drawings. So there's always a, there's always been a 2D element to them. I just, the way that it might be curved or the way that it might be put together all of a sudden changes um, the dimensionality to it. So I've always, I've always gone back to drawing or imagery or something like that in order to make make what I make. To wrap up, can you plug the show at Greenwich House and then also plug uh, the University of Memphis where you're teaching the grad program? Sure. So I, um, so I have a show right now at uh, Greenwich House Pottery. Um, it opened last week, but I think it's open until February 5th, I want to say. And it's called After Image, and it's a series of um, dust paintings, I would say now. I think they're more painting-like than print-like now. And uh, I'm giving a Zoom lecture this Friday. I don't know when this will come out, but um, this Friday uh, at, I think, 5 p.m. Um, Eastern time. And then, um, yeah, I teach at the University of Memphis. Um, I've been here. It's my third year here. Uh, I am an assistant professor here and I have a, we have a graduate program. So we have a three year, uh, graduate program in ceramics. It's, but it's also interdisciplinary. Um, like for instance, right now, one of my graduate students is working mostly in video. So we're, we're definitely, um, really interested in kind of, um, that and the applications for our graduate program are due February 15th. So we have one of the later deadlines, which is which is really nice in that case. And, and we have a number of assistantships and, um, and you get a huge studio, you get a huge studio, um, which I'm very, I was very jealous of, um, <laughs> and access to uh, brand new kilns. And um, we have 3D printers and things and clay printers. And uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really wonderful kind of um, smaller program. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you um, if they'd like to talk about any of the ideas that came up today? If you want to sift through all of these things that I might have said, and then you have some extra questions, um, you're more than welcome to contact me. I have an Instagram, uh, which is at Kate Roberts Ceramics. I'm on Facebook, and and I'm also, um, I have a, my email address is uh, kate.s.roberts at gmail. And you're more than welcome to send um, because I'm, I feel like there's probably a lot of questions, <laughs> but yes. Well, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Ben. I'd like to thank Kate for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to meet her and talk about her work. Also, I wanted to thank Caitlin McClure, who is the gallery director at the Jane Hartsuck Gallery, where Kate currently has an exhibition. She gave me a digital tour of the show, and it was super helpful for this interview, so a big thanks goes out to her. Kate's exhibition, After Image, is going to be up at the gallery until February the 5th. She's going to be giving an artist talk about that exhibition this Friday, January the 15th at 5 p.m., if you're interested in that talk or seeing the exhibition, you can go to GreenwichHouse.org. Before we go, I wanted to give one more plug for the Amico Community Cork Board, which is in support of ClayShare. They're going to be hosting an online ceramic workshop with Adam Field this weekend, January the 16th, and then the next weekend for the second session of that workshop on January the 23rd. If you're interested in signing up for that, you can go to clayshare.com. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. If 
you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. 